Hi there, and welcome back to the channel. So I wanted to interrupt my regularly scheduled programming of uh, capturing my process here, my recording process. And right now, process seems even more important to me. I, w I wanted to acknowledge the uh, passing of Steve Albini, and uh, I'm just completely stunned and shocked. Uh, I'm not a personal friend of Steve's. I didn't know him that well or anything like that. But 20 years ago, it was actually 20 years ago to this year, uh, we recorded a record with Steve, and Steve was the engineer. Uh, and this band was called Spy uh, with my musical brothers Mark and John Skinner and Kerry Brown and uh, we, uh, Steve was the engineer we recorded in Chicago at his electrical audio studios in Studio A which was the really you know super nice room it was an amazing room an amazing studio that was built by Steve and his punk rock buddies literally with like uh, remains and scraps of wood and uh, they put this they just knocked this thing together and it, it was an incredible, incredible uh, thing to see. A punk rock uh, paradise, it really was. Um, the studio was incredible. There were billiards upstairs. Uh, always people milling about, you know, all the, uh, maybe another band recording in Studio B. You could stay there. I mean, it was just an incredible experience. Uh, and the way that it was all kicked off, I guess it's uh, cathartic for me to, you know, tell the story but we were looking for somebody to record a, a record and I had been in an, a, another band we'd been in another band before that it had gone through the whole corporate rock thing and so uh, reading the problem of music really hit hard you know I really I knew exactly what Steve was talking about and so this time around we were had a different mentality and uh, so we had the idea of recording with Steve and somebody told me we'll just call him you know, and I was like, that, that can't be possible. You just call him a notable, you know, famous engineer because he was not a producer. He was an engineer. He wasn't the guy in the corner nodding his head along. He wasn't the guy that might sign you to a production deal and take 25 to 50 percent off the top. He was the guy that put the microphone eight inches from the speaker column. He's the guy that mic'd the drums and put boundary mics on the floor and overheads in the air. That's who he was. That's what he was doing. He wasn't in the music business. He was a sound. He was a recordist. He was a sound engineer. That was his passion. Was making his friend's band sound amazing. Making strangers that called him on the phone. He made their band sound amazing, even if the if he didn't care about the music. It's just unbelievable. We'll never encounter any any other person like this ever, especially not in the music business. It's exceptional. So uh, somebody says, just call him, you know, ask him, be cool. So I nervously tap the phone number out, you know, and he answers the phone himself. This is Steve Albini, or this is Steve, I can't remember what he used to say, or Studio A, something like that. Electrical, electrical. I think he said electrical. But I started, you know, I told him who I was, and he said, yeah, I'll record your record. It's no big deal. I'll see you in Chicago. So I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So we go to Chicago, and uh, we get there. The place is incredible. It's like, it was so inspiring. It really was. It was like this guy put together this amazing life for himself, doing exactly what he wanted to do, surrounded by the people he loved. Man, it was so impressive and so impactive, Im impacting, impactful, inspiring, and I don't even know what to say. It was, it was just major. It was like, whoa, what is this guy doing, you know? Incredible. The studio was amazing. It had billiards table up there, a kitchen, his own living quarters, several, we, we each had our own room that we rented. It was part of the deal, you know? You get cost of tape, place to crash, get to work with Steve Albini, it's unreal, it's incredible. Once in a lifetime experience, once in a lifetime chance, you know? And uh, he had the most amazing rock and roll VHS collection I've ever seen, it was incredible. Saw a cheap trick tape, a Passaic show from New Jersey, I hope I said that correctly. And um, unbelievable. Great movies too, but the, the rock and roll stuff is unreal. It's like the craziest stuff you've ever seen. He had it all. It was just an incredible place to be. And then you'd go down, 
into the into the you know lower chambers, and there was Studio A. Man, analog gear to die for. He had been smart, and all through the the 80s, going to fleas, little trades and swaps, tube tube you know tube swaps, buying tubes, buying uh, Ampeg gear, preamps, boards, mixers, all that kind of stuff, and just slowly accumulated. And then he ended up with just this un incredible studio. But he did it the old-fashioned hard way, like time in the saddle way. And that was his whole thing. And it's just this high level of ethics that you just never see in, the, in, the, in anywhere. You know, not just music or entertainment type stuff, but anywhere. And that mentality had such a major impact on me. It actually impacted my wife. She told me today that when I came back from Chicago and what I got from being involved in the Electrical Audio Forum had such a massive impact on my life that it impacted my wife and the way she does business in real estate. I'm not even kidding. That's the kind of impact a person can have. And that is the impact that Steve Albini had. It was on the ethics side of things. I mean, the music, come on. It's, it's some of the greatest recordings ever made. The drums. The guy who invented fire by shellac, listen to those drums. I mean, come on. If you want to hear ugly art that's mind-altering and life-altering and mind-blowing, kerosene, big black, bazooka joe, life-altering stuff. And then you start talking about this list of records, you know, thousands of bands. Thousand, I mean, I don't even know how many bands, probably over, I'm sure over a thousand. Most of them just called him. That's what Kurt Cobain did, just called him. He told me, and we were talking about Kurt Cobain, because uh, Mark got to use Kurt's Valeno guitar that he used on his, that record. And uh, he told me that that's how uh, it all started with the Nirvana thing, is he just called him on the phone just like anybody would, because that's what you did. You called Steve. He didn't want a manager. He didn't want a label calling him. He wanted you to call him because you're the artist. You're the producer. He's the engineer. He's working for you. It was just incredible. The whole philosophy, the whole mindset, the humor, so much humor, so much so much fun. After like about halfway through the first day, we all started laughing, and I learned so many cool Midwestern things that I had no clue about. I never really spent much time in the Midwest. And uh, the Midwest sensibility is very different for somebody who's a Southerner. I'm from the South. And I always like stayed in the South. I was from Texas, the lowest part, usually. And California was in the su Southern part, and now in Georgia, and I was in Georgia for years. So all this Midwestern stuff is completely foreign to a person like me. And the way everything is like, cut and dry and to the point and he had that, he had absorbed that too, and he absorbed the Chicago way, the work ethic, the whole thing, you know. And uh, it was heavy. It, it, it impacted me in a major way. I got involved in the forum uh, and the, all the unbelievable, like incredible bands that were in that orbit, uh, that were part of that forum, just regular people that were just in these incredible bands. And a completely different construct, a completely different rock and roll construct that was like the biggest breath of fresh air for me. Uh, I just could not believe it. I still can't to this day. And I think back to what that forum accomplished and what Steve was able to accomplish. I mean, uh, his death, he's in every mainstream publication, every major paper, and he always operated in the trenches. He never went mainstream, never. He, he recorded Nirvana because he called him just like everybody else called him. That actually hurt him. Anytime he got, he, that's what he would tell you. If you get near him, they're going to hurt you. He talked to us a lot about that stuff. I mean, I'd say a lot. It was probably a 30-minute block of time that he talked to us about the music business. And, you know, and we told our story of what we'd been through, commiserated on all that kind of stuff. But they'll burn you every time. I mean, that's just the way the system works. And in Steve's world, he was not doing a minor league thing. 
the forum wasn't about, hey, let's get involved with this and do stuff in the minor leagues and maybe we'll get signed to a big label. Uh uh. That's not what it is. This is the A game. We're doing it right now. It's our music, our way. We'll release it through people, friends of ours with handshake deals. Nobody's signing any of the stuff. There's no lawyers involved. See the difference? It's a whole mentality. It has nothing to do with anything that they talk about in the press that they're going to they're gonna talk about. Because you, you really have to understand that forum. Because it really was an extension of Steve. It's not like he was hands-on or anything like that. And we did a lot of stuff that had nothing to do with him. It didn't involve him. Like I said, I wasn't a personal friend. I wasn't involved with him in a personal way. But because he set this structure up and he let people thrive inside of it, people thrived inside of it. I mean, really amazing things happen. They're still going. I haven't been involved in it in a few years, but they're still rocking along. And they had these incredible get-togethers. They were like music festivals. They were the complete antithesis of everything I hate about music festivals. There's nothing commercial there. It's like the complete opposite of like a South by Southwest type thing. And these incredible bands, one after another, and I've never seen so much Midwestern precision. I mean, they would go on, play a half hour set, off the stage, maybe five minutes change, boom, next band, play, off the stage, next band. I mean, this went on all day and all night with precision like a machine. So impressive. No screwing around, nobody's, I mean, everybody's having fun. People might be drinking or indulging or whatever, but everybody knows what they're doing. This is, this is work, man. Whew. Powerful. All these incredible people that were involved in that, that place, all the people that were surrounding Steve in that studio, these bands, these unbelievable bands. I mean, unbelievable. And it's like, it's not known, and nobody, we don't, it doesn't need to be known. This world doesn't need acceptance from the mass culture. That's not the goal. The goal is to make great art right there, right then. It's a real bummer, man, that he's lost. He's gone. We've lost him. We lost. Because it just doesn't happen. Those kind of guys don't show up very often. I, I saw a thing in, the, uh, in one of the interviews that he had done recently, and he said something about being righteous, and that's what I, you know, that's what I took from him. He had such a huge impact on me; it actually had an impact on my wife. She told me today, she's in real estate, and the things that I learned from the forum, from those people, and the things that I learned from Steve from my brief time around him, it was seven days. It was four days of recording, three days of mixing. The things that I learned and the things that I told her that I was expressing as I was, you know, having this experience actually impacted her and her business life. The way she viewed a business deal, the, the ethics side of it, and thinking about things in an ethical way, um, you know, instead of a selfish way or instead of a, 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 a underhanded way that gives you some kind of weird advantage that's you know that's the way it's usually done so it's it's a huge loss on on many many levels you know the first being musical because of all the great music he made my favorite being shellacs uh, the guy who invented fire and um, kerosene by big black and bazooka joe but i love all of it and it was just, you know, I remember when we made the record that the intern, the assistant uh, engineer, there was a couple of them, but uh, the main one uh, that was there uh, for the weekends and also when we went back to uh, mix was Andrew Mason, the guy who ended up uh, founding Groupon. And uh, that was an unbelievable experience as well because I was so impressed with him. He was just so such an impressive kid. He had this... Uh, website that uh, called Policy Tree. I think it was called Policy Tree. And I was blown away by that. Blown away by interacting with him. Blown away by watching he and Steve interact. It's like next level stuff. I was like sitting in the room thinking, man, these guys are way smarter than I am. So it was just, you know, 
that kind of experience. I'm gonna live with it for the rest of my life. I feel so fortunate. I'm just so sorry that all these bands out there can't just call them up and go record with Steve Albini. That just bums me out big time. That everybody I know or anybody who wanted to can't see what that was all about because it, it was it was major. And you know, just cool things about Steve, like when we were there, he kept talking about baseball. And they had this uh, they had this baseball team called the Electrons, and they literally wore like uniforms and everything. I mean, they were serious. And uh, our bass player Kerry was actually a, had been a professional baseball player and everything. So we actually went and played with him. Steve actually slept in, but he he, he insisted that we do it, and then he slept in. But um, we went out and played anyway. And one of the other engineers, Greg Norman, he man, he just cracked it. I thought I could hit. You know, we were doing okay. Then he stepped up and just, you know, was whew, out of the park. But I was just blown away at how structured it all was. Like the baseball was, they were, anything they did, anything he got involved in, it was like, you know, next level. But in closing, I wanted to just, I was thinking about a, an article I just read, uh, an interview. And he said uh, something to the effect, to the effect that he hated goals and that he just believed in process. And, and that just hit me so hard because I've been struggling so much making these goals that, you know, frankly aren't attainable at the moment. And then disappointing myself, realizing, oh, that ain't happening because you, you know, you're not making, you have not made that goal and so you failed. And his thing was like, you know, that's what you, if you just set yourself up to fail when you make the goal, worship the process, not the goals, you know what I'm saying? Get in here and just do it every day and enjoy and love that. And then who knows what kind of fun stuff can happen. If you just focus on the process and not these goals, it'll just disappoint you and make you feel like a loser. So that was one of the cool things that, uh, that, that I just got from him that I really needed. I needed it at that moment. And that's what he was great at on that forum. He would post stuff that just really hit your heart. Like you were just like, man, you know, it just really had that kind of insight. It's a, such a big loss. All right, all my babes at the PRF. X loves you.